Shalom, Shalom Aleichem and welcome. It's my honor and pleasure that we have here in the offices of Rabbi of uh, Online Smicha, we have Rabbi Yaakov Garowitz, who is uh, one of the world's mumchim in the mitzvah of Shatnas. And in, uh, especially in Minnesota, we don't find this uh, often at all. So I would like to take advantage of this, and we have about 20 minutes. We'll try to get kola terukula al regalachas. So the first question I'd like to ask Rabbi, Rabbi Garowitz, for, I hope I'm pronouncing the name that right, is what made this the mitzvah b'mayda have a I understand you are a New York boy, originally from New York. What, what got you interested in this mitzvah, and why it made this become your mission in life, please? Uh, so welcome to everybody, and um, thank you for this opportunity to be able to uh, tell everybody about the wonderful mitzvah of Shatnas. When I was a, in sixth grade, growing up uh, in the 70s in Long Island, so the Rebbe taught us about the mitzvah of Shatnas in Pasha Shavua. Right after that, we got our school jackets, and inside I saw this like woolly material. So I was said over, hey Rebbe, what about Shatnas? So he said, I don't go ask the Rashiva. So the Rashiva said, well, if the school bought it, it's probably okay. I said, what does that mean? You are the school. Like, what, what, what assumption? How can you assume that? So I said to myself, what, and every time I'm supposed to buy something, uh, a garment, I have to travel an hour and a half to have it uh, checked for shot. It sounds crazy. An hour and a half where to? To get to Williamsburg, to Mr. Rosenberg, who's the one who put the mitzvah on the map. So I didn't know at the time, but, uh, but that's what happened. Uh, that's what, that was the only way of checking for shot in those days. Could you explain? I'm sorry for interrupting. Sure. What does that mean? He was the only one to put the mitzvah on the map. What does that mean practically? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so well, let's go back. So, the, so the, all the Torah says you're not allowed to have shatnas, wool and linen together. So, um, wool comes from a sheep, and uh, linen comes from a flax or a, the stalk of a the flax plant. It produces linen threads. So, Jews just were careful when they made their own clothing. They were careful not to put wool and linen together. That was good when you lived in the shtetl all the years. You made your own clothing. But during the uh, you know, subsequent years, uh, you know, when you stop buying from peddlers and things like that, it wouldn't be possible to tell what is really going on inside the content of your uh, garments. So in the, the base Hillel, in the Shulchan Aruch, says a story that Dayan Moshe from Vilna, in the 1600s, he got together all the Jewish and Goyesh tailors in the city, and he asked them if they could tell the difference between the pishtan, which is the real Torah uh, linen, flax, or kanvus, which is what you call today jute or hemp, which are, the, which are cousins or lookalike. Yeah. Or there's something today called rami, which is also something like that. It's, a, it's a similar in texture and feel and look and everything, but it's not the same species, so it would be permissible. So these tailors couldn't tell the difference. So if that's the case, so Diane Moshe said, if no one can tell the difference, so maybe the tailor put in linen and you won't know about it. So if that's the case, you can't buy secondhand clothing. So imagine uh, it's like a you know, in modern day, uh, it would be almost impossible. So for hundreds of years, since the 1600s, that's what people had to do. They couldn't buy from peddlers or going from town to town to buy, sell wares, unless it was a from Jew who told you, and then you could rely on it. Mr. Rosenberger, in 1941, created the first um, laboratory in uh, Williamsburg. He came, uh, his, his father had a clothing store, a uh, suit store for men in, uh, in Vienna. And when he was saved during, during the war, he came to America. And he saw a landsman. He said, oh, we used to rely on your father back home in Alta Haim. What do we do now for, uh, in America? He said, that's a good question. So he, uh, so he said, and, and he said, why Hashem keep me alive? You know, he found his mission. So he put himself through textile uh, school and he read, went to the library and he realized something fascinating. In 1937, the DuPont Chemical Company started coming up with synthetic threads. And from the time uh, they did that, th that was right before the war almost broke out. And then uh, the soldiers and everybody, they had to go overseas. So the, the scientists and the government was interested in trying to improve the quality of the uniforms. So they said uh, they started uh, the whole. There was a whole interest in textile science. Mr. Rosenberger came in 1941, exactly when that was happening, and he said, "Look at that! In 1941, they started having pictures. The difference between the, the flax and the jute, or the linen, or the, the different types of materials." And he said, "I could do to now with the advent of microscopes what the base Hillel, his tailors, couldn't do back then." 
He said, if that's the case, we, we can help with the myths of shotness. So he set about the modern day principles of shotness testing. And he taught a, a whole group of people. And it was good for um, you know, people who lived in Williamsburg and the surrounding areas. Then he taught, taught sample takers uh, who were able to go and uh, send in by mail, snip out a little piece, and then they would send it in by uh, mail. You get a result two weeks later, and uh, you know the rest of the country. But they weren't trained experts. So back then, back then we're talking about 50s 41, or 60s, 50, 60s, right? People were sending in by mail their cloth. They would go to a sample taker who who learned in a couple of hours where to snip off a piece from the button, a piece from the back of the collar, from selected places, based on chazaka of American-made clothing, based on tax laws and different things. Since linen doesn't grow in America, they would have to import it. And since there were tax laws, so they would tax the, the, the foreign um, imports in order to keep the, the cotton growers happy, the local guys. So linen would became expensive. So if you bought a cheap suit that had a union label, and then you checked uh, five strategic places, probably would be okay. And that's not that's not like that anymore. That was good in the 40s and 50s. You know, the textile world changed drastically in the last 20, 30 years. And today, you can take an American product, send it to uh, China or the Far East where they have cheap laborers, come back, and then they write made of USA components. But you have all the uh, all the, the linens and all the wools and everything is all mixed up today. It's so, a look. It's a global marketplace. So we're trying to get in the next 50 minutes, like I said before, a crash course. So let me ask you a question to Shyla. Linen or uh, pishton is very expensive. Is that right? It's a little bit more expensive. So I mean, is it really used or or what we are most of our garments could we assume it doesn't have I mean you can't assume anything you're saying right is that correct um, well yeah you can't really assume if you're buying a cheap suit could you assume there's no pitched on there mm, absolutely not because today there's there's many ways well let's talk about suits per se yeah. all right uh, first of all well, where might you have wool in the suit okay so uh, wool you ha usually have in the actual shell of the suit itself it also because it keeps you warm it's a also it's a resilient it bounces so, uh, it's what was the problem or linen is a bit more common? Well, problem. you can have either way. Today you have linen suits that you have to check for wool. You have a wool suit that you have to check for Which linen. Which one do you find more of a common problem? Usually we assume that, uh, well, well, since wool is very often used to be blended in the outside of the suit, in the shell, because of it uh, jumps and it keeps it, it keeps its shape, it doesn't, it's wrinkle free. Also, it's waterproof, it, it holds its color. It's, it's, there's very good reasons why to use it. You can make it cheaper and blend it. We can make polyester suit today, right. okay? But even if this part is only polyester, but the back of the collar is made of a felt material that often has wool. And then there's a whole uh, uh, cutaway section of a suit, which we have a, have a cutaway section of a main suit over here. And if you want to see here, this is what the inside of a man's suit might look like. So here's a place for the lapel. Here's a place for the pocket. Here's the arm. And then they, then they take the outer material. But in order to, it shouldn't bubble, the tailor or the factory has to put all kinds of schmatas and rags, which could be made of any materials. Whatever they have left And if you have one thread of wool and linen, or linen and wool, it's going to be problematic. It'll be shotness. And how could you know if they have one thread? Well, that's what we're going to do. So, so usually because now when you squeeze this thing, it jumps. So there might be some wool in here in the canvas as well. So wool you usually have in the shell, in the back of the felt, or in the front canvases. Where might you have linen? So linen is a strong type of material. And where you ever need reinforcements, like for example, the most common case would be the back, here's the wool felt on one side. When you hang up the collar on the, the, the hanger loop, you have a pressure point over there, so you may reinforce it with a piece of linen. So you have wool on one side and linen. So the collar is usually that the most, white, this is side. linen. This is linen on one side, and this side is wool. So this is so shotness. This is pure shotness. This is shotness, yeah. So uh, this we, it's possible to remove. It just it may cost a little bit money to have it fixed by a tailor. How Don't that, rely how, how on how a tailor to take out the shotness. They'll leave the residue. You have to give it to only to a trained expert who will clean out and make sure there's nothing left over. And then the guy could sew the, uh, the, the piece. You give him the kosher substitute in his place, then he could put that in, in, in his place. So you might have shotness in the collar, which is the most common. You might have it in the arm tapes. You might also have scrap materials. In fact, a jacket, a standard uh, jacket, 
uh, or a pair of pants even, okay, you have pressure points. Wherever you have pressure points, you might have shotness and you have to check it. So here on a regular standard pair of men's pants or trousers, there are 15 pressure points that need to be inspected. And in the jacket, there are over 50 strategic locations that need to be inspected. Now, that, when you're saying these, these examples, these pla places, you're talking about a commercial company. If a, if a ma pa shop in the backyard is uh, a tailor like that, please. A, a, a pa tailor is, uh, is uh, you know, a, a simple tailor somewhere in the third world country. He's just putting together whatever schmatz he has yeah, exactly. left. Exactly. And, well, that's true. That, that's for sure true. If it's then a, it's not even there. Made. He's putting it everywhere. Then he's putting it even more places, yes. How, so would find, how would you find that? A hand, well, we have to, ch so we, by making a little incision, so what we do is in the, in the shop of the laboratory, we would make a, a little uh, incision. We take a, either a retractable knife and we would uh, open the bottom I mean, of the uh, seam. Up, right? We would we'd, uh, open the bottom of the seam and where, where it doesn't uh, affect the garment itself. From there, we could put our hand in and pull out uh, the different shoulder and then the chest piece and then the collar. So and you become the could, tailor then? No, we were che we're checking. We're able to go through the whole inside kishkas of the suit. And then from there, we look, pull out threads from hidden places. We look in the microscope or Betfias eye. We're trained to, to be able to detect on sight. And then if it's kosher, then we would go and uh, sew it up and, and get but it back to the customer. But Betfias eye, you could check even one, uh, one, one thread? A lot of things you could check with Betfias eye. An uh, expert. For one thread, you could... You could hop from a, on a jacket, That's, a jacket. That, yes, a trained expert should be able to know what is suspicious or not. It might be synthetic and then there's no uh, no issue. Or with a clear-cut cotton. If there's a blend or there's something that's suspicious, then you'll have to pull out fibers, put it under the microscope and to, to verify. All right. So let me share some, some of the interesting things you found in your experience. I mean, it's obviously a fascinating uh, thing that you're doing. Yes. And, and, and one of the most fascinating things, this is the prime example of a chayk. There's no time for this mitzvah. Yes, so uh, even though uh, there is no logical reason, and in fact, we have to show our loyalty to Hashem by figuring out, um, even though it doesn't make any sense, but uh, we, we, by checking our clothes for shotness, and, uh, but we have to, our job is using science and technology to figure out why would the tailor or the factory want to put shotness inside. So as you see over here, wool is very good for uh, men's, ladies, and children's outerwear. Um, and linen is used in strengthening, or they just crush up. A lot of times they use a, a, a padding, a sorted, uh, crushed up material, and they put it in padding. And then there, you can't know what's going on either. It is, is, I gotta stop you for a second. Sure. Because I don't think uh, people pay, pay attention. Do you find that shotness people stress men's clothes as much as women's, women's clothes? Oh, that's, a, that's a very good point, because um, uh, ladies' clothes, because of the the fashion industry, um, and usually uh, uh, look around the ladies' closet that takes up most part of the, uh, they wear different clothing all the time. Right. Man can wear the same suit for, uh, right. so he has two, three, four, five suits, whatever it is. A lady has yeah. dozens of different outfits. So yes, ladies' things actually have more, um, complications. Uh, more complicated things and, uh, and different styles and colors, and yeah, you have to check each one. In addition to that, so it's, uh, they, they, men's and ladies and children's, if they're wearing, just like you can't feed a baby non-kosher food, you can't dress a baby in shotness either. You know. Yeah, so, but, but what happens is today in the textile world is very complex. What the factories do, they crush up, they sweep the floor, and, and instead of uh, putting, you know, buying even sponge or cotton or synthetic, which is cheap, there's something even cheaper. They sweep the floor and make recycled padding out of it. Okay, now you have a chunk of different fibers. What do they use that for? This is the shoulder area. This is the uh, shoulder pads. And that could be shot. This could be, yeah, there could be wool and linen inside. Every every uh, centimeter or in inch is uh, different, all kinds of different fibers inside. And Lamashal, the one that you're holding is shotness? This is called Blei Begodim, which is a machloikis between the, the Minchas Yitzchak, uh, Dair Weiss, that's all from the Eide Haredis. Right. He said, Svek Sveka, because of a double suffix, it could be Make all for me You don't have to start pulling everything apart. You pull three, one, two, three. If you if you don't find pure linen, or if you look with fierce eye and you don't see any linen, you could assume svek svek is okay. But the Chazanish said yarishamayim yachmir. Yeah. So some, you can take your pick. Ask your paisik if you want to be make all machmir. But if you do find linen inside, you then you have to be by then it's wool linen. So then even one full thread. There's no bittel when on a thread. 
It's a double chashev, it's not bottle. So even one thread in linen or linen and wool, it makes well, no difference. Well, you have to see both. You have to see, you have to see wool. Well, and you have a suit, a suit might would have wool, uh, and then you have to check for linen. Or if it be today, it's very common to have, uh, especially in the summertime, linen is very popular. There's a trend to go back to natural materials. Linen is natural, it breathes. In the summertime, it's very cool. It's very, it's very and then they have sometimes wool embroidery. Or wool padding. The padding might be wool in, in the linen. You always have to check. Once, once you have one or the other, you have wool, you have to check for linen. If you have linen, you have to check for wool. Uh, we have uh, different type of samples that, uh, you know, uh, I go around the world and I give uh, Shotner's Awareness uh, campaigns. Um, that's where I'm here uh, in uh, Minnesota. I just uh, spoke now uh, uh, on Shabbos for an hour and a half. But now we're going to give a crash course in uh, 20 minutes. But uh, um, here, uh, I go around the room, and we offer uh, home visits. Anywhere in the world, you can have a home visit. We have an international network of Shatner's Laboratories. The headquarters is in Lakewood, New Jersey. I run the branch in Eretz Israel and in Europe. And I have told me them around the world who I've trained in the art of Shatner's testing as well. So what happens to, uh, what, what, what does the trader say, I want people to know, if, if they find out that they're a suit to Shatner's, what should they do? Well, the first thing is, if the shotness tester has determined that shotness, it might be in a place that's possible to remove. Like the collar, you could the shotness tester could take it out, and then the, you could give them a, a kosher substitute that could be replaced by a tailor. Maybe it doesn't even have to be substituted. Maybe or just pull it out. Sometimes it won't fall apart. Yeah, it's just a, an extra reinforcement, and you won't need it. Um, if it's in the fabric, so the halacha is that you're, it's a, the iser is hanaas levisha. You're not allowed to have the physical benefit from the wearing of shatnas. It's not like basa v'cholov, where you can't have any monetary benefit. It's also hana. It's hanaas levisha. So if you did purchase an, by accident a, a shatnas garment, you could return it to the, the non-Jewish store. Just remember, right on the label that it contains shotness, that the next Jew should should see it, perhaps, and give him a heads up and a warning. And if it's uh, and you, but you could get your money back. There's no problem. If it's too late for that, because you, I mean, what, what what's Plan B? If it's in the fabric itself, and then you can't do anything about it, the actual fabric. So then you could just return it or sell it on eBay to a guy. Do uh, you have any uh, inter fascinating stories that you want? to Absolutely, I go around the world with a suitcase of things I picked up uh, all over the world. We have now, uh, uh, while you're opening up, you, let's let's make it cl crystal clear. It's not only in jackets. Yes. It's not it, only in pants. Correct. Where is the most far-fetched thing that you found shot in this? Because I actually read somewhere, a Shiloh, that even in Uggs, what are they called? Those yeah, Uggs shoes? boots. Uggs, Uggs boots. boots. Yes. I read a discussion. We had, in the last two years, um, we're in uh, 2018 now, so in the last uh, two years, we've had about five different brands. There are hundreds of styles, but about five different ones were, were uh, contained both wool and linen. The wool is the Uggs boot is a wool boot, per se. Uh, some of the trimmings were, were made out of linen or linen blend. What does that mean, some? That means... The, st or some that, styles. So some of the styles had this problem. So, so if you have a wool Uggs boot, it would be recommended to show it to a shotness tester to he would have to determine that there's no linen uh, as one of the embroidery. And then you could imagine, then you could assume that, you, that you, there's no way you it's could... It's not really it. fixable, no. You no. could return it to the store, possibly. So whoever thought a shoe would have a... Yep, that's a... Right. And what other what other ties? Somebody uh, so ties is a... a you know, all right, ties is a, um, a little... Well, let, let's give the four rules. Okay. The, the four things, besides men's suits, which always require checking because of all the internal components, so even if it's polyester, by international law, less than 5% does not need to be listed on the label. So you, um, you could have, it's a, also it says, when they write on the, sh the label, it's the shell, it doesn't include embroidery, interfacing, padding, ne buttons, holes, it, not, none of that is ever included. And if you have one thread, it's already shotness. So besides suits, men's suits and men's ladies and children's wool winter coats, which always need checking, all right, so besides that, there's four basic rules. If we catch, uh, we'll catch 99% of the shotness by following these four rules. Before I just explain to the listeners um, how the rule, what the four rules are, I'll explain how they work. It'll be similar to checking food for bugs. Just like we have three categories. We have something which is commonly infested, 
uh, occasionally infested, called miyot hamotsui, and then something that's rare. So let's say rice or certain things, which you must check them for before you eat them. So the, it's a, the rabbi said, if you have uh, something which is infested, oh, you, you definitely have to have chiyuv, you must check the rice. Mokhzak. Yeah, mokhzak in, in uh, tolaim and bugs, so you have to check. Similarly, by clothing, a certain brand like Hugo Boss suits have 90% shot is in the collars. Really? So there you must check it. You, ha you have to. You, you have to do it. Some say not even to wear it. Hugo Boss suits. Uh, wool suits or any, any suit? All Hugo Boss all suits usually generally 90% have shot is So, So they have uh, they have shot the, uh, that's uh, that's That would be something which is commonly infested. The uh, the other case was like say by food you have an apple sometimes there's a worm in an apple so the rabbi said don't just take a chance on chazaka if you see a brown hole or a mushy stuff cut it open and inspect it before you eat me it's like five ten percent or something like that okay the svar them uh, hold a little bit higher they say you need by even thirty percent right but that's when it's in, in nature here by shotness there's a factory sticking in it's man made the, whatever the tailor or the factory has whatever they want to do they could one day you could have all of the whole factory could be shot is tomorrow only some of them shot or none shot is so it's not a natural type of chazaka so some people say you have to be even more careful than just the, the regular meat of and therefore it's recommended to be checked however if it's a uh, if we have now if not one of those uh, the four rules will be what that middle category, Mirhamatsui, the rules I'm about to give you. If it's not one of the four rules, that will be something which is uh, very rare, like a watermelon or a banana, which usually is not no problem, and you could just wear it as is. Everything is fine. So, what are the four rules? This is the most important part. Rule number one is we look at the label. We don't rely on the label because you can't rely on the accuracy. Very often, uh, they, the company runs out of labels. They just take something else. Um, or, uh, or we said by law, less than 5%, they don't even have to list on the label. Yet, if there's one full thread, it's already shot in us. So here are the four rules. We look at the label. It's an indication. So if it says one of the following four things, then we have to give it in to inspect by one of our uh, the shotness testers, and Bezashem will catch the shotness. All right? The first rule is if it says wool on the label, we have to check it to make sure there is no linen. Every, every wool suit has to be checked? Well, suits always. With that, we said that's an accept. We always have to check. So even 100% polyester suit, 100% cotton men's suit, you always have to check. Okay, by ladies, polyester suits, that's okay, you could be make all of that maybe. But we'll see, if it's a man's wool suit, any kind of man's suit, because of the internal components, you always have to check men's suits. Yeah. Besides that, but if a regular, any other item, if it's a skirt, if it's pants, or trousers, if it's a sweater, a jumper, uh, a dress, uh, a shirt, anything that has wool, any percentage, because again, we can't rely on what they say. They may say it's five percent; it might have fifty percent. You How can't rely. How about midday Lila? How about uh, pajamas? Is not an issue. No. Why? Because they're usually made of cotton or uh, or polyester, and there's uh, and there's no kashash shashash. That'll be the third category. Mitzvah in a All right, but the four rules are: if it says wool, any percentage, we check it to make sure there's no linen. Rule number two: if it says linen or flax. So they're telling, so you have to see where that's the outer shell. What about all the internal components? Okay, it might be the embroidery, it might be uh, somewhere else. So uh, we have to check the overlock stitch could, could sometimes be problematic. Uh, there's sometimes impurities blended in. Just like we have a concept of an 18 minute matzah, we stop the run every uh, 17 minutes. We go with scrub brushes to make sure some dough doesn't stick to the roller. Well, that's good when it's under our Jewish control. But we have sweaters that come from the Far East. They have giant machines that do the combing process. And when uh, the first uh, part gave in the wool to be combed, then the second day the linen company sent the linen to be combed, and the third day the wool company. So they gave in wool, they got wool, they wrote on the label, 100% wool. But in the meantime, it picked up linen impurities. Right. There's no third species, there's no, there's no bittel, there's no nullification. So it's problematic. So even in a simple sweater, there's no shoulder pads or anything, or interfaces that could also be. So once it says wool, we have to check for linen. If there's linen, we have to check for wool. Those are the first two rules. The third rule, if it says on the label, other fibers or mixed fibers, abbreviated OF or MF. Uh, so they're telling you there's mixed fibers. What are those mixed fibers? So you have to see. And the, th the fourth rule is ignore the label. But we have to understand how linen looks. Uh, the natural linen look material is a certain beige uh, material. Here's a, what they call, this is the raw flax. Okay, pishte etz. Okay, and when they actually take this, they make a, 
um, they can take this, they could weave this into the back of a collar. Here's the wool old lady's winter coat. Here's wool on one side, reinforced with the linen inside. Now it's again, no, notice a natural beige color. How do they, also, hard, how do they harden? Well, that's a, it's a, they stiffen it. They put starch or naturally, they, it's a tight weave. It's a, they can make the, the collar out of it. Um, but you can have it in any color. It can be dyed to be any color. So, but if the natural uh, way of looking at linen, though, is some type of material. Here's a whole inside lining of a, of a coat or a suit that the whole thing was linen. All right. Now, notice if you hold it up to the light, you can actually see, uh, I don't think the viewers will be able to see this clearly, but there are thick and thin threads. If you hold it up to the light, every five or ten, one in both directions, one thread is thicker or, or thin. It's called yeah, yeah. like a tweed, like a tweed yeah, yeah, type of material, yeah. all right, or little white dots. If you see any of these irregular weave, thick and thin threads, little white dots, so that's an indication of linen look. So I don't care what it says on the label, if it looks like linen, we have to assume there might be a small percentage of linen. They won't have to write it on the label. And then like rule number two, once there's linen, you have to check to make sure there's no wool. So following those rules, the four rules, if it says wool, linen or flax, other fibers or linen look, we're gonna catch 99% of the shotness that's out there. The rare event that there's both mislabel, also wool, also linen, that's one in a million. So it's like in a, in a what's a clow. So you don't have to worry about those things. What we wanna to try to do is, we wanna do things that are normal. We're not looking for khumras. We're just trying to keep the normal things and understanding how fabrics and the textile world works today. So by following these rules, we're gonna be on the safe side and we're gonna catch most of the shotness. Now, Would you like to be Messiah with a bracha? Because I know me and you want to go to Mincha. Okay, uh, so just first of all, besides uh, the the Iser Isa, which every time you wear the garment is, is uh, you know, it's a it's an Iser, so it's very severe. But Chazal tell us uh, that it's a Zohar that there's nothing that blocks the prayers from being answered, like the wearing of shotness. So um, it's very important to to check uh, our clothing. Um, uh, some people, you know, we want siyad Shmaya, we want to have uh, health and parnasa and shidduchim, and uh, 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 we want to be successful in all different ways. And everything we're doing right, you know, sometimes we run, when we have problems, we, we check mezuzahs, we run to mikubalim. It could be your own garments or not, or shatnas, and it's br blocking the prayers from being answered. So we have, like, amazing things, you know. Sometimes we just to show one or two quick samples over here. Here's a case of a, we said rule number two is if it says linen, so here is a 100% linen, no shoulder pads, no anything, but the embroidery was a wool, a wool embroidery on the flowers. That's ornamentation. They don't have to write that on the label. Here you have a little kid's uh, outfit that says wool on the label, but the factory made a linen label with the name of the store. So they, they actually put the linen label that made the thing shotness. You wouldn't even think about that. Okay, and then you have uh, another crazy case, and this one is a very important. There was a, a, after I gave a lecture, and I said when a tailor adds a patch of something, you should be careful. So uh, some uh, gentleman brought me his wool talus that the tailor got frayed here. He went to a religious tailor in Borough Park, and he put a linen patch on a wool talus. The boy said it blocks the prayers from being answered. He thinks he's a big tzaddik, he's davening, and his prayers are being answered. The, the shotness is blocking it. He's doing an Avera every time he davens. Okay, so it's, uh, and this has been going on for 10 to 15 years, well, we know the unwillingly. Big, the, the big day kuna were... Uh... That's true, but uh, that, we don't have a say dochalosa, say when you're actually wearing wool and linen together. We have many stories, even from stores, you can't just rely what the salesperson tells you because they're, they're not sure themselves. And maybe I'll just end off quickly with uh, another, here's another uh, doozy, as we say. But here was, they were just selling in a uh, religious uh, shop in Muncie, uh, an exclusive uh, lady shop, that the brown th little threads here, which were made out of linen, and then the white wool was put right through. Wow. She bought this roll of material from a Frum Jew in Manhattan, and she was about to make a whole line of ladies' things. Baruch Hashem, right in the beginning, we caught the shotness in Eretz Israel, and I called the, the store in Muncie after Cholomoid, uh, Sukkis, and uh, it turns out the, the proprietor's own daughter was wearing it for the entire Sukkis. Because she was unaware. She, she said, I got it from a Jew. Like, why should I have to bother checking? Right. And this is, unfortunately, you can't rely on the, the labels because of uh, many reasons. They lie. They fall off. Uh, they don't know. They, they don't know. So there's, uh, you can't, it doesn't include any of the internal components. 
and you can't rely on Jewish stores either. Uh, once it, the only way to be assured that we're not wearing shotguns as good kosher consumers is if it has one of these four rules: wool. We check for linen, linen we check for wool, if it has other fibers or mixed fibers, and if it has the linen look, again, the beige, whitish uh, color, okay, with little white dots. I'll just show you an example of the white dots again. And that's something like, here's a, uh, a sweater from the company, uh, fam famous company, and the brown is wool, but the little sleeve has little white dots in the, in the gray sleeve. That's an indication of linen, and there is linen in there. It actually says it on the label itself, but in tiny letters, and the person who purchased it wasn't even aware and didn't, didn't uh, bother reading the label. So what I recommend is, the first thing you want to do if you read want to be label. careful is read the label. It's only an indication. It doesn't guarantee anything. If you need first aid, and a lot of people, they, you know, they live in places that they don't, it's hard to get to a shot in his laboratory, so you could call me up. And uh, I give first aid over the phone sometimes. What's your, you have a website? We or? have, you can call me by my email. Uh, you can send me, it's R-Y-G-U-R-38. Uh, it's Reb Yaakov Gerwitz. Okay, so R-Y-G-U-R-38 at gmail.com. People send me questions from all over the world. I try to answer as soon as I can. Uh, can I give a phone number? Uh, my number in Eretz is uh, 972 and then my cell number is 526-334417. And um, if, 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 if I don't have an answering machine, but I try to, if you call, I can try to answer back. If you're calling from Chutzlar, so then send me an email. I won't be able to call you back from uh, Eretz Israel, but uh, if you're local in Eretz Israel, I try to call you back when I can. Um, I travel around the world giving these lectures. If you would like to bring Shatna's awareness to your uh, community, we would uh, uh, glad to, to come. We do a presentation in schools, shuls for men, ladies, children. Um, I, I, just... will, I will just say <laughs> that much, look over here, much, much more stuff that due to the short of time, we can, Rabbi, Rabbi Garowitz has, Garvich has much, much more to say, but where he's short in time and I'm short in time here. And I definitely want to wish him uh, a lot of atzlocha and a lot of brachas to what he's doing. And he took upon himself a mitzvah that's... Uh, that's uh, that's hidden and people don't know about, and uh, he's uh, he's bringing it up to the front, and they should give him koyach to be mefaris in the mitzvah, and give him brachas for what he's doing. I mean, koyach, that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, and it be a pleasure to, to see you. And let's makabel on ourselves the mitzvah of shatnas. Hashem will answer our tefillahs, build a base of mikdash. We're interesting enough to call him walking around wearing shatnas in the belt. Oh. Every person, every Jew has his chelik and Torah, and we should all be zocher to show our loyalty to Hashem in one of the few chukim that we have, and should be on ourselves in the midst of low silba shotness. Thank you very much. Thank you.